We come now to God's Word this morning. We're continuing forward in our series in Luke's Gospel, so I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word or in the the Pew Bible in front of you uh, to Luke chapter 11. We're in Luke chapter 11 this morning. Called an audible about midweek after the um, bulletin was already printed. We're just going to be reading through verse 44. We're going to read verses 37 through 44 before turning to the next half of what you have printed there um, a couple weeks from now. So we're just going to read verses 37 through 44 of of Luke uh, chapter 11. Um, It is important to have that other section, though, for you to reference, but we're just going to be reading and focusing on verses uh, 37 uh, through 44. Let's give our attention now to the reading of God's word. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked to dine with him. And so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe, mint, and rue, and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. A gracious Father, we come now to this passage of Scripture, Lord, which is in many ways a difficult passage for us to read. So, Lord, we pray that according to your sovereign grace that you would soften our hearts to receive it, that you would open our eyes to see Christ, that you would open our eyes to see ourselves, that you would unstop our ears, Lord, to receive uh, this word of grace from the mouth of our Savior. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. It's perhaps one of the most common criticisms of churches, perhaps one of the most common reasons given by people as to why they will never set foot in a a house of worship ever again, the most common criticism, which is the church is full of hypocrites. As I was reading R.C. Sproul's commentary on this passage I was reading R.C. Sproul's commentary on this passage this past week, and there was a story that he, he told about the, the late D. James Kennedy, who was the former pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church and the founder of Evangelism Explosion. D. James Kennedy, when he was faced from time to time with someone who would tell him this, tell him, I, I will never come to your church because the church is full of hypocrites. Here's how he would respond. He would say, yes, you're right. But there's always room for one more. Why don't you come and join us? As long as there are sinners in church, the church will have to wrestle through hypocrisy. We'll deal with hypocrisy. But how are we supposed to handle it? How are we supposed to respond to it? Are we just to resign ourselves to hypocrisy, saying that's just the way things are and that's just the way that things are going to be? Should we just ignore it, put our heads in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist? Cover over it and hide. Well, what does Jesus show us in this passage? What we see in in this passage of Scripture is how Jesus handled hypocrisy. The hypocrisy that he saw in this this hard-hearted crowd of religious do-gooders that was gathering around him. These these Jewish leaders who were, were interested in him, Interested enough to invite him into their homes for a meal? How did Jesus handle hypocrisy? And how are we to handle it? Well, before we get there, we need to get a sense of who Jesus is talking to here. Who is his audience? His primary audience in this passage is a group of Jewish people known as the Pharisees. 
our passage says that he was invited into the home of a Pharisee. But who are the Pharisees? Oftentimes they're quite misunderstood. We, we, we use that term, don't we? That term Pharisee as an insult. You're such a Pharisee. But who are the Pharisees actually? We like, we like to think of them sometimes in extremes. We like to think of the, the Pharisees as the, the Westboro Baptist Church of the, of the Jewish religion. These people who, are, who were so far off from the truth, so extreme in their beliefs, that there's no way that we could ever have anything in common with them. We like to, in our minds, put as much distance between the Pharisees and ourselves as possible. When in fact, who the Pharisees represent, the Pharisees simply represented a, a party in Judaism that was committed to the authority of the Scriptures, and sought to apply the scriptures to the life of the people of God. Which is not too extreme of a position at all. Did they take that position way too far at times? Yes, of course. That's why Jesus is talking to them. But we cannot, with a blanket statement, say that the Pharisees represent some caricature of hypocrisy. They were rather the expression of, of mainline Judaism that, that sought to live based on the authority of God's word and apply God's word to God's people. They believed, oftentimes they believed the right things and they often taught from God's word correctly. In fact, Jesus himself in Matthew 23, he said that the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you. The point is that you and I are not so unlike the Pharisees. We have much more in common with them than we think. The, the same spiritual dangers that the Pharisees faced are spiritual dangers that you and I face as well. And so when you think Pharisee, do not think in extremes. Because then every time you, you read that word in Scripture, every time you, you come upon a sermon about Pharisees, all you're going to say in your head and in your heart is, man, I'm really glad I'm not like that. I'm really glad I'm not like them. So when you think about Pharisees, don't think in extremes. Think about uh, your standard, friendly, neighborhood Christian. Think about the, the, the sweet little old lady down the street who's gone to church her entire life. Think about someone who, who knows all the right words to say, who knows all the right things to do. Because the, the same spiritual dangers that face the Pharisees face those type of people. They, they, we, we face those same dangers as well. We're affected by them. And what was the primary spiritual danger that the Pharisees ran into? Back to the words of Christ in Matthew 23. He says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. The problem with the Pharisees was the problem that every, every well-meaning Christian struggles with from time to time. We all struggle with this. Hypocrisy. Preaching one way of life, right? Saying you believe the Bible, thinking you're a good religious person, preaching a level of spirituality, but not practicing. Not living in line with what you say you believe. The Pharisees struggled with it, and we all struggle with it. But what are we supposed to do with that? How are, we, how are we supposed to reckon with that reality in our hearts? Christ shows us here in this passage. He shows us that to properly respond to hypocrisy, you need to understand it for what it is. You, we need to understand it. We need to have our eyes open to what it is, to have it exposed in our hearts so that we can repent of it, so that we can turn away from it unto Christ to receive mercy and grace and forgiveness and his grace to help us. And so in this passage, Christ, who is the light of the world, Christ shines a bright spotlight onto the heart of this Pharisee. And he shines a bright spotlight onto our hearts to show us both the, the causes and the consequences of hypocrisy so that we can see it in our hearts for what it is and respond in repentance and faith in our Savior. 
What we find in this extended passage is, is the three causes and three consequences of hypocrisy. And this, this is brought to us in the form of, of six woes or six cries of warning that he's given both to the Pharisees and, and to their, their partners in crime, the, the scribes or the teachers of the law or the lawyers. The three causes and three consequences of hypocrisy. This morning we'll, we'll turn our attention to the first half of that, right? To the first section here, the three causes of hypocrisy that Christ exposes here in this passage. Now the inciting incident here of this interaction, of this conversation, is the fact that a Pharisee has invited Jesus to dine with him, to come over for the, the midday meal. And as we read, the, the Pharisee saw what Jesus was doing, and he was astonished by it. Or more accurately, he saw what Jesus did not do. Jesus did not go through this long ceremony of cleansing himself before dinner. Now this wasn't something that was commanded by Scripture. This was a tradition. This was a ritual that the, the Pharisees had commanded. It was common for good, polite people to engage in this when you came over for dinner. But Jesus did not. And the Pharisee noticed it. He was, in fact, speechless. He was astonished. He was wondering at what Jesus was doing. What this Pharisee is most likely thinking in his heart is something like, how dare Jesus offend my hospitality like this? H how dare he come to my table unclean? And so Jesus, who dis discerns the thoughts and the intentions of all hearts, he, he uses this as a gracious opportunity to teach this Pharisee and those gathered around him to teach on the, the overarching ultimate cause of hypocrisy. I know I said we we're going to talk about three, but this is a bonus, bonus cause, an overarching cause for hypocrisy. We see it in verse 39. It says, And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You see, the, the ultimate cause, the overarching cause of all religious hypocrisy is an emphasis on external performance over and against internal heart change. An emphasis on external performance over and against internal heart change heart change. That was the root of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and that's the root of all religious hypocrisy. It's the root of so much of our hypocrisy as well. Here's what it is. It's, it's a contentment with appearing clean on the outside, appearing buttoned up on the outside, all while harboring what Christ calls the, the filth of greed and wickedness, harboring sin on the inside in your heart. It's, it's an obsession with the external, an emphasis on, on performing and keeping up appearances. The, the hypocrite says in their heart, it doesn't matter what's going on in my heart. Oftentimes, heart, hypocrites will not even consider their heart at all. They say, it doesn't matter what's going on in my heart. All that matters is what people can see. If I can just put on a good enough show on the outside, no one will really know me for who I am. No one will really know what I'm really like on the inside. That's the heart of hypocrisy. Someone content with mimicking the, the behaviors of a Christian all while harboring sin and harboring a heart that is far from God. As Christ said elsewhere of the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. As Charles Spurgeon once wrote, the hypocrite is often an exceedingly neat imitation of a Christian. The hypocrite is often an exceedingly neat imitation of a Christian. To the common observer, he is so good a counterfeit that he entirely escapes suspicion. A, a hypocrite is somebody who looks the right way on the outside. The problem is, as Christ exposes here, when, when we content ourselves to just 
focus on the external, to focus on performance, to focus on what people see, when we content ourselves with external counterfeit Christianity, as Christ says here, we are living the life of a fool. That's what Jesus says in verse 40. You fools, did not he who makes the outside make the inside also? Now, Jesus is not just insulting these people. He's not just calling them names. Biblically speaking, a fool is a very technical term. What is a fool, biblically speaking? Biblically speaking, a fool is somebody who lives as if God does not exist. That's what a fool is, someone who lives as if God does not exist. That's what Psalm 14 says in verse 1. The fool says in their heart... There is no God. You see, to live the life of a hypocrite, to, to perform the part of a Christian on the outside, all while your heart is full of wickedness, is to live as if God does not exist. How is that the case? Because God made both the inside and the outside of you. That's what Jesus says here. Meaning, he sees you for exactly who you are. There's no pretending with God. There's no hiding from God. There's no pretense or facade that you can put on to, to fool Almighty God. To, to live like that, to live as if God can't see you for who you are, that's to live the life of a fool. Living as if God doesn't exist and if God, as if God somehow doesn't see us for who we are. That's the root of all hypocrisy, foolishly pretending on the outside, cleaning up your life on the outside, all while harboring sin on the inside, leaving that heart untouched. Now, what causes this? What causes this to rise up in our hearts? That's what Christ begins to teach on with these six woes. We'll deal with the beginning three of them. These woes, these warnings that he calls out in to the Pharisees. Cause number one, majoring on the minors. Majoring on the minors. Look back at verse 42. It says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. See, the, the Pharisees, they were meticulous. Meticulous in their observance in small matters of the law. So meticulous they were, so obsessive. Just imagine this, if they had ten leaves of mint or, or ten pieces of a, a small spice they would section off one of them to give to the temple. That's how meticulous they were in their obedience to small matters of the law. But what did they neglect? What did they neglect? The ultimate purpose of the law, which is justice and righteousness and love towards God and love towards neighbor. As God commands in Micah 6, 8, has he told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to, love kind, and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. See, hypocrites are obsessive in small matters of obedience, but not in large matters, not in ultimate matters. And why is that? It's not hard to see. Small matters are easier to control. In small matters, it's easier to pretend. Oftentimes, small matters of obedience can be performed without your heart ever being in it, without your heart ever changing, and you can then hang your hat on small matters of obedience, right? All the good things you're doing in small matters of obedience, and surely all the small good things you're doing then outweigh the bad, outweigh the sin in your heart. That is the heart of a hypocrite. Here's what this looks like for us. It's hanging your hat on the fact that you don't cuss, right? You don't use bad words. You don't use foul language. You've, you've never said a bad word. In fact, you speak 
politely and with great decorum. You mind your manners. You say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. You guard your tongue in front of people. But when you get alone or when you get in front of people you're comfortable with, the real you comes out. And the real you has a vicious tongue, a complaining tongue, a backbiting tongue, a gossiping tongue, a grumbling tongue, a divisive tongue. You bless people, yes, to their face, but curse them behind their back. You're dedicated to matters of small obedience, but not to the ultimate cause of love and justice. That's the heart of hypocrisy. This looks like hanging your hat on the way you love your family, the way that you're loyal to your family, the way you prioritize family above all else, hanging your hat on how, how loving and giving of a person you are. And of course that's good. But where's the disconnect? When you're faced with someone in need, someone who isn't like you, Right, someone you feel some distance from, perhaps they're from the, the wrong part of town, the wrong socioeconomic status, they're, they have the wrong color skin. You see that person and, and then that, that pretense of, of love and benevolence disappears. And then the judgment comes out. You respond to them with an icy cold heart. Right? That person doesn't deserve anything from me. I worked for what I have and so they should work for what they have. I don't even want to look at that person. I don't even want to be around them. That is the root of hypocrisy, majoring on the minors, majoring on obedience where it is easy, but neglecting justice and the love of God and neighbor. It's cause number one. Cause number two, fearing man over God. Fearing man over God. If you look back at verse 43, it says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplace. A hypocrite is obsessed with what people think because they crave the honor and the approval of man, the vindication of man, the honor of man over and against the honor of of God. They, they fear man rather than fearing God. And so what happens? They use religion as a way to bring honor to themselves, to bring glory to themselves, rather than to bring honor and glory to God. This is what Jesus is calling out here in the Pharisees. They love to get the best seat in the synagogue. They love being recognized with a place of honor where everyone can see them. That they love the, the greetings in the marketplaces, these long and ornate greetings. Oh, blessed be you, Rabbi. They love these, these greetings that they would get when they're seen in the marketplace. And it's so different in our day and age. It's so easy for, for the church to become the place that we come to worship ourselves. To worship and glorify ourselves rather than to worship and glorify God. To, to serve ourselves, to be served rather than to serve God. God. It's easy for our Christianity to be something that we display. Our spirituality becomes something we display on the outside in order to show people how good and religious we are. To have the church become the place we come to be congratulated and, and, and worshipped and praised for, for our wealth or our dedication or our spirituality. It's easy to, to crave that, that recognition, to crave that honor, to crave that attention, and, and to seek to bring that glory to ourselves that belongs only to God. And, and this is where hypocrisy comes from. It, it's fearing man over God. And it's not hard to see that on display. It's not hard to see this hypocrisy on display but when church becomes the place to see and be seen, what happens, right? What happens when church becomes the place to see and be seen? You have churches, right, that are, are full on, on special occasions, right? Full on Christmas, 
Full on Easter, full on Mother's Day, full when there's a, a baptism or a special event because that's when you come to see and be seen. But the other days that attendance drops down to almost nothing. A great diagnostics of, of this in our hearts about whether or not we're, we're approaching the church and approaching Christ with a heart that desires to worship him or ourselves, a great diagnostic of this is to ask ourselves honestly, do I engage in religious activity? Do I attend corporate worship? Do I attend Bible study, prayer meeting because other people are there or because God is there? Because Jesus is there and I want to meet him. Do I come to, to meet with all my friends and family or do I come to meet with God to please and honor man or to please and honor God, to bring glory to myself or to bring glory to God? One more cause of hypocrisy. Cause number three, a hidden spiritual deadness. A hidden spiritual deadness. Look back at verse 44. It says, Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and, walk, and people walk over them without knowing it. For a Jewish person, it was forbidden to come in contact with the dead. You would avoid graveyards. You would avoid the dead because when you came in contact with a dead person, you would be ritually unclean. So you avoided that spiritual uncleanness. You were very careful to avoid the grave of a person. Here's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. Your hypocrisy comes from the fact that you are spiritually dead on the inside. And the tra tragedy is that your spiritual deadness is unmarked. It's hidden. It's covered. So not only does it then lead you into sin, but anyone else who comes in contact with you, anyone else who steps over you, they don't see it. And they're unclean as well. Hypocrisy is contagious. And of course, there's a sad irony here. He's speaking to this Pharisee. And what was this Pharisee's concern? It was about clean and unclean, wasn't it? This Pharisee was so obsessed with external cleanliness, so obsessed with cleaning up his life on the outside that he had never stopped. Siri's talking to me here. Siri listens to my sermons, I guess. So this Pharisee is so concerned with the outside, cleaning himself up on the outside, that he had never stopped to consider the status and the condition of his heart. That's what happens here. Because if he were to look into his heart, if he were to, to see himself for who he is, he would not see cleanness. No matter how clean his hands were, his heart was dead and unclean. If he were to look into his heart, he would not find cleanness. He would look and see the stench of death. His heart was like an unmarked grave. It was hidden but full of uncleanness, hidden but full of death. He could not see his eyes were not yet open to the, the fact that the path that he was going down would lead to his death. That anyone who came in contact with him, anyone who followed him would be led astray as well. He thinks he's on the path of life. But he is on the path of death and he cannot see that danger. You see, beloved, the, the ultimate danger of hypocrisy is that when we spend all of our time focusing on the externals, Focusing on all the things that people can see, focusing on small matters of obedience, focusing on being liked and honored by other people. When we spend all of our time looking outside of ourselves, we'll never consider what's going on inside of us. We'll never look at our hearts. We'll never consider the condition of our hearts. Our hypocrisy will blind us to what's actually going on inside of us. And as, we said, as we've said before, this is incredibly dangerous because what matters most is your heart. What matters most isn't what people see on the outside. What matters most is not the facade, the pretending. What matters most is what's going on inside of your heart. 
What matters most is whether or not your heart has been transformed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What matters most is whether or not you've been born again from the inside out, brought from darkness to light from the inside out. What matters most is whether or not you've received and rested upon the finished work of Christ and have had his Holy Spirit make you alive inside. And then out of that comes all sorts of good works that are given by the grace of God and so the point of what Jesus is getting at here is that if your heart has not been transformed, no matter how good you may look on the outside, no matter how well you put on a show and perform, no matter how well everyone else thinks about you, if your heart has not been changed by God's grace, what Jesus is saying here is that you are spiritually dead and on the path towards eternal death. And what a tragedy it is when we cannot see that, when we are like unmarked graves and we hide our spiritual deadness, when we cannot see that danger. This past week I had a, a terrifying experience while sitting in my study. I was sitting there actually, in fact, preparing for the sermon and I heard two loud booms coming from the, the window by my study. I heard two loud crashes. I thought, oh no, this is it. This is it. I went outside to see what those two loud crashes were. And there were two dead birds outside my windows that had somehow made some sort of arrangement that they would each hit one of my windows and crash into them and unfortunately they died. This isn't the first time this has happened that birds have come at my window there. But I, I, th I thought to myself, what motivates a creature to do something so self-destructive like that. Why does this keep happening? And of course, it's very simple. The birds don't see the window. They don't realize it's there. They think they're flying into another tree or they're flying, flying at another bird. They, they do not see the danger of that window for what it is. And so they fly full speed towards it to their own death. They cannot see the danger. And that is what Jesus is trying to help these Pharisees understand. He's trying to open their eyes. He's trying to help them see the cause of the hypocrisy in their hearts. Because they're blinded to it. He's calling them to turn away because they're flying towards certain death. Even while they think they're flying towards life. Oh, beloved, let us, let the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ expose our hearts today. Let the light of Christ shine on your heart today. Here's the point. We all struggle with hypocrisy. It's not something that just a select few Christians struggle with. We all struggle with hypocrisy. I struggle with hypocrisy we're all given to focusing on externals, to obeying in small matters so we feel good about ourselves, to seeking honor and applause. That's in all of our hearts. And yes, it's dangerous. But you need to hear this as we come to close. The only true hypocrite, the only ultimate hypocrite who is an unmarked grave, the only true hypocrite is the one who won't admit it. The one who will not acknowledge it, the one who will not turn from it, the one who keeps up the facade. And you also need to hear that there is so much freedom and there is so much life in just admitting it, of letting go of the pretense, of letting go of the facade and being truly known as you are and truly loved by Christ. Hypocrisy says, if you let people know what you're really like, if you let people know what's really going on in your heart, if you let God know what's, who, you, who you really are and what's going on in your heart, if you let people know what you're really like, they will reject you. They won't accept you. So you need to perform. You need to pretend. In the gospel, Jesus speaks a better word to you. 
In the gospel, Jesus says to you, I know you exactly as you are. I made the inside of you. I made the outside of you. I've seen the file on you. I know your heart. I know your sin. I know your hypocrisy. It's not a surprise to me. I've taken that, in fact, to Calvary's tree. And I've made atonement for it. So that when you turn from it, you can be known, truly known, inside and out, exactly as you are. And truly loved by a gracious God when we turn to Christ in repentance and faith. Oh, friends, what freedom the gospel gives us to admit our hypocrisy, to with confidence, with boldness of, of the grace and mercy of God in Christ to stand up and say, It's me. I'm the chief hypocrite. I don't live perfectly in line with what I say. I don't live perfectly in line with what I preach. I, I'm self-righteous. I'm uh, obsessed with, with, with what people think about me. I, I hide the spiritual deadness inside of me. To say to our Savior, is there still mercy today? Is there a healing balm? Is there forgiveness? Is it too late? Am I too far gone? I'll leave you with the answer from the hymnist where he writes, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Oh, beloved, the good news is it's not too late. The grace of God is for us today. The grace of God is for the Pharisee. It's for the tax collector. It's for the religious hypocrite. It's for the sinner. So turn to God's grace today and find mercy and help in your time of need. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, what mercy you've shown to us in your Son. Oh, Father, you know us exactly as you are exactly as we are. You, you know my heart. You know our hearts, Lord. You have searched us and you know us. You know when we sit. You know when we rise, Lord. We, we can't hide from you even if we go to the depths of the sea. You know who we are, Father, and that's why in the abundance of your love you've sent to us your Son to cleanse us, to make us new, to give us new living hearts. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of those gathered here today, that you would expose our hypocrisy and drive us to Christ, drive us to your grace, drive us to your mercy. Let us see, Lord, that there is a balm, that there is a fountain that we can be cleansed in. Work this in us, we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen.